Today's video is sponsored by Alexander's Assemblage of Alchemical Arts. D&D's potion options have always been a bit limited, but fret no longer, adventurer. Within the pages of this beautiful hardback tome are over 100 unique, interesting, bizarre, and wonderful concoctions for you to discover, quaff, imbibe, or throw at your enemies. The potions aren't the only treasure in the book. Each potion comes with its own story written from the perspective of Alexander, as he describes potions he has brewed, developed, and discovered over his life. It provides fantastic flair in addition to the wonderful potions. But reader beware. This book doesn't just contain boons and rewards. No, dear reader. This book is designed to be used on both sides of the table. A villain will have access to these potions as well. Hopefully none of the players are allergic to bees. The potions are designed for 5th edition, Pathfinder 2nd edition, and Old School Essentials. Check out the free samples and click the link in the description below to pop a cork and see what happens. Now what you're here for. How a Paladin's Sacrifice Led to the Greatest Comeback Story Ever There are many stories throughout time that bring forth emotions to those who experience them. D&D is one of the best ways to do this. Throughout the course of events that transpired, I literally had tears in my eyes as we got to its end. I hope you all enjoy it. This story is the most epic comeback from our paladin. We are using the unofficial Elder Scrolls tabletop role-playing game for all of our races and classes, with a few things sprinkled in from various 5e rulebooks. We're currently located in the realm of Skyrim, yes, the same place as the games. Our group is comprised of Isla, an Orsimer Glamour Bard, Ateus, a Redguard Crusader, the paladin of this story, Olivia, a Breton Warden, kind of cross between a Druid and Ranger, Quintus, an Altmer Pyromancer, Sisa, a Bosmer Necromancer, Tazita, a Khajiit Thief, and myself, Winder, an Orsimer Barbarian Fighter. This story will focus primarily on Isla, Ateus, and Olivia. Our story started with the group being formed to assist in freeing the city of Helgen from the bandits that were inhabiting it. Now, as our party finished that quest and wandered about, a new threat started to arise. Weeps were starting to pop up here and there, and the dead were beginning to walk again. To make an already long story short, we find out that a necromancer named Potema, from a major conflict a few hundred years ago, is back and wants to rule Skyrim through the current body she occupies. We find out as we're dungeon crawling that her lieutenant is a death knight. This guy is a super power undead champion, a total badass, and we find out that he was the former high king of Skyrim, so dude's a big deal. We try to stop the death knight from obtaining this powerful weapon in a dungeon we go through. Unfortunately, because we had a fight with some other baddies in the dungeon, when the death knight shows up on a literal nightmare, we can't stop him and he takes the weapon. Our DM tells us after the game that it's very powerful. It needs three attunement slots just to even function, as well as a particular character alignment. Time passes and we get word that an army of the undead is making its way to a major port town on the northern edge of Skyrim. Since we're the plucky heroes of the story, we head there, using some magic to make a weeks-long journey into a three-day affair. It's here that Isla lets us in on a plan she's had for a while. Isla says that she wants to be a spy for us, as part of her backstory, she loves swindling people, especially if those people make themselves out to be better than others. So her idea was to reach out to Potema and offer herself as an ally. She could feed Potema some harmless information and get some about her and report back to us. The rest of the party all say that this plan is very risky. We don't know fully what Potema is capable of, and she might just kill her to make a point. Finally, after much discussion, we relent, and Isla sneaks her way behind enemy lines. Ateus, our awesome paladin, is on his griffin Mount Sorin, and flying in the sky scouting out the possible numbers of the undead. He's also in a position to intervene in case Isla needs assistance. This comes into play later. Since we're all on Discord, we're all listening into Isla's conversation with two of the commanders of the undead legion that's headed our way. Both of them are vampires. The commanders are wary of Isla, as they know what she's capable of via Potama. To prove her loyalty, the vampire says she can know where Potema is if they could bite her. Isla, already in way over her head, agrees. The vampire bites her and sucks out some of her blood. The DM explained that to be turned into a vampire is not an instantaneous effect. The bitten have to go five days without being cured before they fall dead, and on the sixth night rise and become a thrall for whoever bit them. 
The commanders explain that Potema is in a stronghold nowhere close to where this battle is currently at, and cannot be reached before Isla would be turned into a thrall. Isla leaves in a huff and panically contacts Ateus, telling him that she royally screwed up. Ateus picks her up on Soren and starts flying back to the town. All the while, Isla is frantically apologizing. After a while, they pass over one of the undead camps, and they notice they are being followed in the air. The Death Knight is coming for them. Isla starts up her former backup plan of escape and starts the casting of Teleportation Circle through a ring of spell storing. Unfortunately, this takes 10 minutes to cast, and the Death Knight is steadily gaining. Ateus quickly shoots off via Ascending Stone what is happening as the two prepare themselves. The rest of us are in town helping raise their defenses. Olivia, who is keeping track of the stones, hollers for everyone as we gather around. She explains what's happening and we're all looking at each other helpless. It would take a good hour via air for us to get where they were. Olivia pulls out a scrying orb so that she could see what was happening. Meanwhile, Ateus and Isla try all that they can to slow the Death Knight down, hitting him with long-range weapons, spells, anything to get him to stop chasing them or prolong his arrival to cast the teleportation circle. It doesn't work. The Death Knight gains and catches up to them. When he does, we go into combat as everyone tries to down the other or make their escape. It is obvious that the Death Knight has the upper hand, taking Isla to a third of her health with a lucky crit, and Ateus to almost half. Throughout all of this, the rest of the party are talking about the situation, and trying to help plan as much as we can to stop this. At this point, Roll20, the system outside of Discord that we use to play, glitches out, and the DM almost skips Isla's turn. We catch this in time and are thankful for it. Isla casts a spell to immobilize the Death Knight. We get lucky as he rolls poorly and he's frozen. The fight's still not over as he can try to pass on his turn, and the Nightmare is still right next to the Griffin. At this point, we hear Ateus tell the DM that he mentally commands Soren to get Isla to safety, and then proceeds to launch himself at the Death Knight, knocking himself in the night into the air, miles in the sky. We're all shocked by this and we all scramble, trying to find some way to save Ateus. The DM said that even if we tried, there would be a good chance the Death Knight could be saved too. We all sputter in disbelief. We can't save him. As they're falling, Ateus and the Death Knight talk, with the Knight revealing some information about Potama. Overall, he was just put into a situation that he couldn't control. Olivia, who's been watching this via scry and relaying us the information, feels the spell cut short just as they impact the ground. We're all in shock over this as the DM ends the session there. The DM says he'll be in contact with Ateus's player over what to do, since we still want him in the game. A week goes by and we all hop onto Discord. As Ateus's player joins us in the voice call, we all see his character name isn't listed, and we all lament over this. We start the session with Soren landing and dropping off Isla to the rest of the party. After she's off his back, the griffin flies away, heading in the direction of where they came from. The rest of the party asks what happened as Isla breaks down. We all try our best to comfort her, but we do all feel slightly resentful. After all, she had been the one to try this scheme and it backfired in a big way. The party guided Isla back to our temporary lodgings and we all tried to rest. The undead haven't stopped their march and will be upon the port town by the next day. A few hours into the night, some of the perceptive party members are awoken by the two vampire commanders, who have crept into the chambers to assassinate Isla for betraying them. A fight ensues between the power vampires and the party. Midway through, the DM describes that a shadow appears through the skylight as a massive winged creature smashes into the fray. It was Soren, and on his back is Ateus. We all collectively lose our shit. It takes a good 15 minutes just for us to stop laughing, jeering, and in my case crying before gameplay could continue. Ateus describes that he does not look the same from this brief display. His previously black hair had new blonde and red highlights. He was not wearing the armor that he had on when he fell, some seriously awesome plate mail. He also said that his left arm had been completely replaced with an ebony prosthetic that the party had gotten a while ago, and it behaved like an actual arm. The last thing that he said was changed was that his sword was not his normal magical sword. It was one of the swords that Ateus had been collecting throughout the campaign. His previous magical sword was one of legend, a Shi-Hai. This sword was only gifted to extraordinary people who worshipped a particular deity. Ateus was the first person to obtain the sword in hundreds of years. He was well on his way to make this weapon into a god-tier level weapon. In previous sessions, the DM said that when it was at its peak, the last owner of the Shi-Hai was able to cleave apart an entire continent. After his heroic entrance, we quickly mopped up the vampires and all surrounded Ateus with hugs and a few slaps from the party. Isla was tripping over herself apologizing, 
and said she owed Ateus about a million favors. He said jokingly that was too small a number. When asked, Ateus explained that he was brought into this weird afterlife with his god, and they talked about ways on how to bring him back. He said he was now a host for a different god, named Ebonarm, who would continue to develop until his and Ateus' personality melded together. He explained that this would take a few centuries, but he was effectively immortal. When I, Winder, inquired about the Shihai, since the two of us had been helping each other in forging it, Ateus said he gave it up. He gave up this potentially god-tier weapon to be with us. We all got some rest after we all welcomed him back and got ready for the siege to come. A true sacrifice and an amazing return. Absolutely great group and great storytelling. Thank you for sharing another wonderful story from your group. Before we take our leave, don't forget to subscribe to our channel All Things D&D. Stay tuned for more amazing Dungeons & Dragons content every Friday.